my goodness. Well, it looks like a lot of things are happening on the landscape that's changing the landscape. As we talked about in the first hour, uh, State Senator Tim Schaefer is pushing the drug test. Everybody who gets food stamps, who gets public assistance, he said, oh, we got a budget problem, and therefore we're spending thousands of dollars on these people, and we must drug test them. But right now, some people are saying all across the country we're looking at a mass strike. It's a large strike. People are saying enough of this is enough. And they're tired, worn out with it, and they're ready to fight back. Joining me in this hour is Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Uh, he's going to be with us, I think, for the first half an hour. He's a world-renowned statesman, economist, former candidate for the Democratic uh, Party nomination for President of the United States. And uh, Mr. LaRouche's political opinions and writings uh, can be seen most prominently at the LaRouchePack.com website. Uh, Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, how you doing this morning? Well, I'm alive and well with the change in the time zones today. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Mr. Magic said he lost an hour, so we've been trying <laughs> to find that out. <laughs> but let's get right to it, uh, because I know you know you have limited time. This mass strike we did in the first hour. We talked about how this new wave of thinking is coming in through Wisconsin. We've seen it all across the country in Ohio in Senate Bill. Five. Now we're seeing Senate Bill 69 being snuck in very quietly. We see a whole agenda being pushed back to destroy unions, uh, to victimize people who are poor. What's going on here? Well, first of all, we got it's an international crisis. It's spreading throughout much of the world. Uh, we see it, it started in North Africa. Is spread it into the Middle East, is spread into the United States, and it's going all over the transatlantic world as a whole right now. And it's going to increase uh, beyond belief. We're going into a great crisis, but you find out that more and more of the people are finding pockets of leadership where they're responding. And what the thing we have to do, which is what I'm concentrating on, is doing what has to be done. All right, now the people are aroused. They know that they're being cheated, destroyed, and so forth, not just by right-wing Republicans, but other, by other things as well. And the people are aroused. And with a, if we can continue to give them the kind of information about the fact of the situation and what the remedies are, we're going to find, as we saw in Wisconsin so far, from the masses of people there, we're going to find that in our, among our own people, uh, we find new leadership. We find that also in Europe, for example, in, in Dresden, which is a part of the old Saxony section of Germany. You had a, another teacher's movement, a very important one, mm -hmm. and other, other developments are occurring. So we, then you have at the same time what's breaking out right now in Japan is the sun has misbehaved itself. It has set off with its uh, solar flares has set off a situation which, was, you know, 100,000 people in Japan just disappeared from the planet. Yes, they haven't been uh, able to find them. <laughs> well, wow. well, but they found, they found four trains where, the people, where people had been in them, and they were gone too. Yes. Uh, we found the only thing that held up of note was that the nuclear industry in Japan performed excellently. They lost nuclear reactors. They had all kinds of catastrophes, but they didn't hurt the people. Now, if we're looking at a mass strike, now you use the term mass strike. I'm always tough on definitions. Give me a definition of a mass strike and, right, and give me evidence of it being implemented all around the world. Okay, well, you got the, t the use of the term mass strike has two principal origins, though the fact is well known by historians uh, for much further back. But the first one is you had the, this great poet, P Percy Bysshe Shelley, who in the concluding paragraph of a, a piece he published, or probably published by him, uh, on, the, uh, he, on the poetry, he explained that there are periods in history in which uh, people are influenced, even beyond their own understanding of what they're doing, to move in a certain direction. And this, the people are transformed in ways which cannot be explained in ordinary ways. 
Then you had in the beginning, this was back 8, 1715 or 1815. Then you come up in modern times with Rosa Luxemburg, who codified the term mass strike. And she was right on this one. But the idea of mass strike is what was shown to occur in Europe as a phenomenon which was out of the control of politicians. It wasn't organized as a trade union type of strike. It was just the people rising up and responding to a situation on their own. And that's what I'm going to ask you about. What are they rising up against? I mean, I mean, I saw it in Tunisia. We saw it in Egypt. We're seeing it yeah. now in Libya. We see it in Wisconsin. We're seeing it uh, in Indiana. We're seeing it in Ohio. We're seeing it in Kansas. What's going on? Is this what well, you're talking about? Absolutely. This is what's happening. What's happening is, first of all, you've got to look at the world food crisis and similar kinds of things. People of the world have had it. That's no. what... The that's what it is. Now, you take the case of, take they're the food crisis. They're fed up to here with what? What are they fed up with? Well, let's, let's take food shortages. Mm -hmm. North Africa, food shortages. What's happening in Europe? Food supplies are going short for people because they're using them to make fuels for automobiles and things. Ooh, that's right. So, therefore, what you've got is the people are faced now. Take the United States itself. You have, we... The, they have a debt crisis here, a, a speculation crisis, a hyperinflationary crisis. And we're just about ready right now on the edge of going through another one of Bonanski's bailout schemes. And if it does, we're going to go into a real hyperinflation, which, which can bring down the entire nation very quickly. Are we, are we that close, Mr. LaRouche, to, the, to this massive collapse that you and others have talked about? We are very close to it. And if we don't stop it, it'll happen. And that what Bernanke is, is pushing for, for another round of bailout, we're already going into a very high rate of hyperinflation. And if he goes to another round, it's going to accelerate that rate of hyperinflation. And who knows what that will lead to. But what you have, you have the ordinary people in our country as in other countries. We think about our own country because we know the facts here better than we do outside the United States. I, I know the facts, but most people in the United States don't. They know the facts they're experiencing themselves. Look at the rate of unemployment. Look at the people who have not been working for a long time. Look at the government saying, well, we've cut down the labor force. They didn't cut down the labor force. They shut, they shut them off from any hope whatsoever. Uh, look at the, what's happening to every part of our institutions. Our, uh, the, the, look at the food supply. Look at the jobs. Look at the conditions of life. Look at the cost of living. Our people have found out by their own way that the situation they're facing is hopeless in the sense that the existing institutions of government, in the United States, as in other parts of the world, the institutions of government are refusing to respond to the urgent needs of the people. The people are convinced they're faced with a hopeless situation. Are we headed for a revolution? We could be. It could be, unless we break, wake up. Now, I mean, now, let me stop right there. What does wake up mean? What are you recommending when you say wake up? What does that mean? What well, I'm on the side of the mass strike. I'm saying that people like the teachers, there's 100,000 people demonstrating in, in Wisconsin now, that, that they are right. They are demanding that this st nonsense stop. Now, what I know has to be done among, apart from the fact point of supporting them because they're right. Huh? The fact is that we can solve this problem. We, but what we've been blocking, getting the blocking on is we would have to go to the Glass-Steagall Act immediately. Now, you've got, that is coming up again right now. Now, for people who don't know what Glass-Steagall is, uh, you need to refresh a okay. lot of memory. A lot of people may not know what this is. <laughs> well, first of all, President Roosevelt... In 1933, got through a bill called Glass-Steagall, which is actually a bill which implements a provision of our federal constitution. What Roosevelt did with Glass-Steagall was he shut down Wall Street, just like the Wall Street we have now, only this is worse than then. Mm -hmm. And by doing that and putting a bank a group agreement under which all the Wall Street-type banks were told, go off and take care of your own affairs. Don't bother us anymore. 
because our banking system, that is the regular banking system that people deposit money in and so forth, the commercial banking system and related kinds of banks, are protected by the federal government against speculators. And by putting that bill through, Roosevelt saved the United States because that law, the Glass-Steagall law, opened the gates for the federal programs which saved the United States. So what they did was regulated what the banks could and could and could not get into, especially as it relates to speculation like derivatives and stuff like that. Exactly. That's, and so what, you know, was what the former head of the uh, Federal Reserve System did, you know, Alan Greenspan. Greenspan is typical of the swine, but this goes back earlier. It goes back to something that happened in the 19th. Inch by inch, people were trying to get this kind of thing going. Even back in the 1950s, they were trying with the, uh, you know, some of these banking acts, bank holding company action. Okay, so they now, were doing... Uh, but hold on, Mr. Lewis. I want to go back to the unions just for a second, if I might. Yeah. Um, the unions, even though they're pushing now, Mr. LaRouche, they set back and let millions of jobs go overseas. They set back and let NAFTA uh, go through. They set back and let Glass-Steagall be implemented. And they didn't think that, it, that somehow these folks were not going to come after them. They stepped think, back and did nothing. When and you, people like you and others and myself were warning and saying, "Look, you better get on top of this." And now, now you, the cat's out the barn. Exactly. Now the question is: is to provide a coordinated kind of support for the the growing expression of the majority of the people of the United States coming out of things. And you find that the teach the teachers the teachers. Uh, issue is very important in this Why? for all of us. Why is the because, teacher issue important? Well, because it, it, the teachers are devoted. These are people generally between the you know twenty five and forty five, something like that. There's the majority of them. What they care about as teachers is the minds of the young people. They're trying to save and protect the minds of young people. So they have taken the leadership, and this has been true internationally. They've taken the leadership in terms of. Young people, younger people, are saying, we're going to save the nation. We've got to save the nation. We've got to save society. We've got to protect our people. So this movement is the movement which is the key. And you have even trade unions that are, have allowed themselves to become corrupt agents of political forces. Of, they you know, have gone along with it, Mr. LaRouche. And that, that's and right. That, and, that, and so when they, I had, you know, that's my statement to them. We tried to tell you when black mass unemployment was high. They didn't take a stand. We said put millions of people on the street, fight this, because you're losing workers. We said that when jobs went overseas, they did and they sent back, Mr. LaRouche, well, and they goes, didn't do what they should have done. This goes all the way back to 71, and 1971 and so forth, when this thing was set into motion. It was set into motion once they killed two Kennedys, and we got Nixon, and the whole thing was set into motion with the aid of of getting a war, a Vietnam War. You have to go back, really, to the Vietnam War and the killing of Kennedy. The killing of Kennedy scared the pants off Johnson. He wouldn't do anything. We sent a lot of troops over into Vietnam to just be slaughtered for no, re no good reason. When Kennedy had been working to prevent that, Douglas MacArthur had warned against doing that and was supporting Kennedy on that, so they killed Kennedy. And then when Kennedy's brother... Robert was about to be get the nomination for president of the United States as Democratic nomination. They killed him, too. Then we got Nixon. And at that point, all this kind of stuff just really began to happen. And it they happened. killed Dr. King and Malcolm because both of them were opposing the Vietnam War and a host of other things. So exactly. they just assassinated any key people during that t period of time to shut exactly. this down. That's what you're saying, to shut down That's the right. mass strike. And this is London and Wall Street. This is the international financial system that really runs the planet today. See, that, and a lot of people don't know that. Break that That's down right. a little deeper. You say London and Wall Street. Now, the people know about Wall Street. They don't know about London. Explain that. Well, you, you got, take the case of the Irish now. What's so important about the Irish? Well, the Irish have, have been fighting against the British uh, together with our patriots since 1688. Mm -hmm. And that's when the point that the uh, the new British Empire came into being, was being established in London and other places. And so the British Empire 
was created out of this period. And so you take Europe today is completely controlled. Russia is also included in that, in victims of this process. Continental Europe, the, Brit the British Isles as such, uh, are controlled by an empire. Most of the world, this empire controls most of the world. Africa is totally controlled by the British-centered operation. Uh, all the other parts of the world are controlled by this imperial power. And thus you've come to a point that we've got to break the back of this imperial power if we want a civilization. Now, are these bankers that control this wealth, like the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, is that what you're saying? Or, or is there another group? Uh, I heard well, you some, 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 some alpha group. Is this what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, that's right. This is, the, this is the old Roman Empire. This is a system which has existed since the founding of the Roman Empire. And it's gone through the Byzantine Empire. It went through the old Venetian Empire, the so-called Crusade period. It went through this long period of religious warfare from 1492 to 1648. And it's come, it came back again, of course, in the form of the British Empire, which is what dominates the world today. It's not the British people. It's the British Empire, which is a, an empire system like the Roman Empire. And they control Wall Street. So, wow. This is, this, you see, a lot of people don't... Realize that we're talking with Lyndon LaRouche. Lyndon LaRouche is a world-renowned economist. He was a candidate for U.S. president of the Democratic Party in 1980, 84, 88, and 92, and 96, and 2000. Do you want to talk to Lyndon LaRouche? He's here for another few minutes. Let me hear from you at 821-9890. 821-9890. Let me hear from you. All right. 98.9, you're on the air with Lyndon LaRouche. Go ahead. Yes. Um, how are you doing, Mr. LaRouche? Um Talk about George Soros. What role does he play in it? Whoa, that's a, that's a well, name George, you guys have looked at, George Soros. Well, <laughs> George Soros's career began as, he, as an adolescent when he was working on behalf of Adolf Hitler as a Jewish boy, disguising himself as an Anjou, and working for, actually, as a support organization for the Hitler operation. His then, in the post-war period, he became an agent of the British. He's a British agent today. Uh, he's a very nasty person. You can imagine, you've got someone who's a Jew, who is part of, of the killing of Jews. He didn't personally kill Jews as such, but he was supported it. He was part of the machinery. Then he goes on with that and never regretted what he did in working for Hitler. And he get, becomes a British agent, and he's continuing with a, as a British agent today, uh, doing the same kind of things, in effect, of killing people, he now does it officially. For example, he's the worst a enemy that Africa has uh, among British operators. Mm -hmm. He runs a genocide operation. He still is, like like he did back when he was working for Hitler. As now, an uh, now, Soros, wasn't he one of the chief supporters of President Obama? Of course. Well, he was not the supporter of Obama. They used Obama. I, I don't think they supported Obama. They used him. I don't, think Obama, I don't think Obama had much to do with it himself. He, he was just swept up and by being used. They used him. My and goodness. Obama, if you want to talk to Lyndon LaRouche, 821-9890, 821-9890. If you want to ask him about uh, such things as Senate Bill 5, uh, this whole push uh, by this new regime to drug test, to uh, some people say to repress, uh, to stop the mass strike movement, let me hear from you at 821-9890. Magic 98.9, you're on the air with Lyndon LaRouche. Go ahead. Hey, 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 Corey. Uh, this is, uh, I was just wondering, are y'all talking about the Illuminati as far as the rock trials and stuff goes? That's a very good question. Mr. LaRouche, are you talking about the Illuminati? Not, not really. That that the Illuminati is a part of this process. Wait, wait, wait a minute, hold on, not, hold on, brother. I'm, I'm gonna give him a chance to answer. Go ahead, Mr. Larusso. It's, it's a part of a process, and it, uh, but it's not the B conspiracy. Uh, it, what is? It's the old Roman system, which has just been you know, went through various stages, and it's now called the British Empire. And we have a lot of people like Wall Street, the United States, represents the same thing. And, and so what you're saying is that nothing has really changed. It's a continuation of, of something that's been going on for a long time. And we in the United States and in Ireland have been the, since uh, 1688. We in the United States and Ireland who have been victims of this process typify those people who were outside the European imperial system who have been fighting against it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we were founded by people who came over here 
to get away from the problems in Europe, to bring the best of European culture into North America, which we did, and we brought a lot of people from Europe here and from other parts of the world. So we, we represent uh, uh, that, that culture. Uh, Roosevelt typifies it. We had other presidents like Abraham Lincoln, others typified this. And so we, we're in a part of fighting even to defend what we stand for, even in our own country. Mr. LaRouche, I know we've got just a few more minutes with you. This mass strike, this fever that's sweeping the world, it seems like a lot of things are happening all at the same time, from Saudi Arabia to Libya to Japan to what's happening in this country. Is there something happening in the cosmos that's creating all of a sudden all of this mass all of these mass movements, this mass change, is this what you were talking about, about something happening in the universe that's causing people to move and causing events to happen in a certain direction? Well, there are two things that are going on at this time. First of all, among people, there are movements among people which cannot be simply explained by ordinary language. <clears throat> but we know they occur. We study them. We see how mass behavior is affected in, particularly in crucial times by this kind of process. At the same time, the sun is acting up now. And what happened in Japan is an example of what can happen when the sun acts up. And the sun is acting up, at least from our standpoint. And therefore, we're going through that kind of period. So these kinds of stresses, combined with the stress on life, the bad conditions of life, the bad political policies, the conditions, worsening conditions of life of people, all come together at certain times and cause a crisis, which has been there for a long time, to suddenly come to a peak. And that's what's happened. We've reached a peak point where many different things, which have been accumulating over time, have intersected a major solar event. And this solar event is causing earthquakes and so forth on this planet now. So everything is coming together, and it seems like everything is coming down on us one at the same time. And that's what's happening. Now, in closing, um, you say it's time to act, that we must put forth an agenda. If you can, tell us what direction you believe we ought to be moving in. This one act is absolutely essential. First of all, we've got a bailout problem. We've got to cancel a bailout. And this involves, you know, 20-odd trillion dollars of bailout. It's a swindle against the American people. If we pass a Glass-Steagall Act in the form it was originally conceived by Franklin Roosevelt, put it back in, we can bring this thing under control. If we bring this under control, it means we're going to cancel much of that debt. The debt won't go away. It will go back to the banks it belongs to, not to the real banks not to the regular banks. That means that we will have freed our government from scores of trillions of dollars of worthless debt. Once we do that, we can stop the bailout process. We can fund the states to get back into function. We can launch large projects as Roosevelt did when he did Glass-Steagall. And these projects will, we can create now if we, with this kind of action I know we can create seven and a half million jobs in the United States in fairly short order. You, you have something called NUAPA that you are pushing. What is NUAPA? NUAPA is a, the, the greatest water project the world has ever known. It's one which would, would change the weather, change many things inside the United States. It would also be a revival of our, of our economy now. It's the one program we have which is in place to, go, to be installed which has been tested, it's known, and so forth, put this in effect, and we're going to have, with WAPA, we can have a, a, a completely new uh, perspective for the United States. All right. I want to thank you, Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, for joining us. And uh, by the way, you can catch him. You can get more information about uh, what they're doing at LaRouche Pack. That's spelled L-A-R-O-U-C-H-E-P-A-C dot com. Am I right about that? Thank you so that's much. That's right. Thank you so much, Mr. LaRouche, for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Good to be with you. All right, I appreciate it. All right, as we this and talk about this, uh, Harley Slinger, are you there? Yes, Harley, I'm uh, here. Okay, hold on. I'm going to take a couple of calls, then I'm going to come with you. Uh, we're talking about Harley 60 Bill, I'm sorry, Senate Bill 69, which is basically selling all people who are in need 
in need now of assistance, you can't get it unless you get drug tested. If you don't, and you got to pay 15 to $20 to take the test yourself. Well, heck, if I had 15 to $20 to spend, I wouldn't be coming to you for cash assistance. Some of this makes no sense. Let me get your response to this quickly, then we'll go to the calls right away. Harley Schlanger, West Coast representative for Mr. LaRouche. Go ahead. Look, what we're seeing, as Mr. LaRouche just uh, identified, is a, a group of bankers that have gone wild who essentially see the population as the enemy. They think there are too many people, especially too many poor people, but they've created the poor people. They've shut down the industry and sent it overseas. They're now attacking our teachers, our police, our firemen. They're attacking virtually every way people have of making money. And now the people who have been cast aside who have to rely on food stamps. You know, one out of nine Americans is now using food stamps. Yeah, what's that number, like 45, 46 million? Yeah, Six million so people. It, Good God. Yeah. And so then you're taking those people and, and you're criminalizing them, essentially. So what they're basically saying is if you're poor, it's your own fault, and we're going to get rid of you. This is part of that thing by Prince Philip that they were talking about reducing the world's population through eugenics and a host of other things. Am I correct about this? Yes, and that's why we see this mass strike, because people don't know about Prince Philip per se. Not too many people do. But, well, your, your audience is privileged because they get to hear it from you. <laughs> but most people don't know about these things. But what they know is that their conditions of life are getting harder and tougher, that parents are having a harder time keeping their children in school, they, they can't afford to pay for college. They can't keep a roof over their head. And so what they don't know is that Prince Philip and his type have classified them as useless eaters. That's right. And he's the husband of Queen Elizabeth of Great Britain. So this is what you're up against. With and the they founded, he founded something called the World Wildlife Fund, which targeted countries like Egypt and India and Brazil and most of black Africa and said that there are too many people on the African continent. Ooh. And they use institutions like the International Monetary Fund to tell governments that you cannot pay to help people. You cannot put money into medical care or education. You have to pay the debt first. And so it's the same thing we're seeing with Governor Walker now in Wisconsin and Governor Kasich in Ohio. They're saying we have to pay the debt first, but they don't say that. They come out and say unions are getting too much money, the pensions are too big, poor people are not willing to work. And so they pass legislation to penalize the people that government should be helping. That's exactly what some people are saying. Stay right there, Harley. Let's take some questions. You're on the air now with Harley Schlanger, West Coast representative for Lyndon LaRouche. We just got off the phone with uh, Mr. LaRouche himself. Let's hear from you at 821-989. If you, you can ask him any question regarding uh, Senate Bill 69, Senate Bill 5, the mass strike, what's happening in the world, Japan, Egypt, Libya, doesn't matter, eugenics. Uh, and I'm going to get into more, a little bit more of that and this association with Prince Philip and Hitler. So let me hear from you at 821-9890. Magic 98.9, you're on there with Harley Slinger. Go ahead. Yes, you're on there. Go ahead. Hey. Yes, you're on there. Come on. Hey, what's up, man? I was just saying, I just wanted to say, man, uh, not only uh, they, this is like the, uh, this is like the, the end of every, not the end of everything, but the end, like the uh, more the end toward what, the end. Of, what do you mean? Thing. What do you mean when you say the end? What does the end mean? This is like, you know what I'm saying? Like, this been started. Everything that he was saying, like, a lot of black people been seeing these type of things going on right. just within their community alone. Right. So, uh, and I'm the type of person I, I so like you said, uh, So you're saying when black people been experiencing this, and now white people are experiencing it. Exactly. And so I now like people are beginning experience. to understand that, the, that all of this has been going on for a long time. And exactly. that, that's what I hear you saying. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Exactly. As, 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 as y'all said, y'all said the greed. It's like the greed is getting bigger. And you, and you see they don't care about who, uh, you know what I'm saying, suffers, especially when the greed gets involved. You know what I mean? When Hold on for a minute. Harley, Harley, you want to respond to what he said? Sure, he's exactly right. It's the end of an era, the end of this several thousand year history of the Roman Empire and government by empires. Now, the problem is 
that you could have something like after the fall of Rome, where we were in a dark age for almost a thousand years, where people had a hard time surviving. A plague would come through and wipe out a third of the population of the planet from time to time. Are we at the point of where we could see a total breakdown in the system that we're currently living under? Are we there? We're headed into it, and this is this hyperinflationary danger, because if the money supply gets out of control, which it has been, with Bernanke pumping money with the quantitative easing and the bailouts, if that money gets into the system, we're going to see an inflation like what happened in Weimar, Germany in 1923, where a loaf of bread cost a billion marks. This is what Mr. LaRouche is talking about with food shortages. We're just seeing the beginning of that. And so the caller's right. And with gas prices. And I am just totally amazed. Uh, Harley, there's no outrage whatsoever at these gas prices. I mean, this stuff is going to hit with this Japanese thing. They're going to try to push this maybe over $4 a gallon. Where is the national outrage to this? Well, that's what we're seeing. You see, when people show up at 100000 in Madison... They're not just showing up because of the, the bill that was pushed through by Walker. They're showing up because they're beginning to realize their future no longer exists. And the, the last caller was right. The black community has been the one that was hit the hardest. It's been on the edge for years. But now it's even worse in the black community. And what makes it worse is we have an African-American president who doesn't seem to care. And so you have a sense that the institutions of government are no longer influenced by the people. And so people come out to protest. Now, Kahari, on this question of gas prices, everybody's hurt by it. Everybody. But what we're seeing, which is interesting, in Germany, the German people who have put up with every environmental bit of insanity for the last 20 years finally protested by not buying ethanol gasoline. And the government was trying to force everybody to buy it and they stopped buying the new gasoline. And this is causing a huge crisis in Germany. I think we're seeing just the tip of the iceberg now. There, was a, there were 10,000 people in Austin, Texas yesterday, because they're going to be cutting $12 billion from the school budget. In Detroit, Michigan, they're going to shut down half the schools, and they're going to have classroom size of 60 students. Oh, my God. Goodness. And this is going to happen in Columbus. It's going to happen in Cleveland and Toledo. So we're going to see, until the people take back government, we're going to see a, a worsening of the conditions of life. Are we? I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Mr. LaRousse. Are we on the verge of a revolution? Well, it's the kind of revolution, hopefully like the American Revolution, where we use the constitutional principles to do what's right. But if we don't have that, we could have something like the French Revolution, where heads start rolling. Ooh, we don't good. want that. We Gracious. don't want to see that. My goodness. All right. Magic 98.9, you're on the air with Harley Slinger. Go ahead. Yeah, I like that, Harley. How, how do we... Speak up, my brother. I can barely hear you. Speak up. I like that. How do we impeach the people that's in office? Now to get oh, that? great question. Harley, he says, how do we impeach the people that are currently in office? Is that something that we ought to be doing? Should we elect new representatives? How do we take how do we take control of this? Is what he's basically saying. Well, it's two steps. I mean, in the case of Wisconsin, where you actually have the right for recall, they're talking about recalling eight of the Republican senators who voted for this bill. Okay, and, and, and that's, so that's, so that's, a, that that's impeachment. Done. That's something that could be done. But I think we have to do something. We can't wait till 2012 to the next election cycle. We have to scare the hell out of these congressmen. They have to become more frightened of their constituents than they are of Wall Street. And that's why the remedy of Glass-Steagall works so beautifully. Now, wait, whoa, 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 stop. You said scare. Now, wait a minute. Now. I need to understand. What do you mean scare the H out of these people? What do you mean by that? All right, I got a simple example. If we have these kinds of demonstrations continuing and growing as they have been in the last weeks, they have to have a concrete proposal. If you have the teachers and the other people who are demonstrating calling for Glass-Steagall and saying to the state representatives, don't cut our schools, don't cut our transport, don't cut our security, go to Washington and demand Glass-Steagall. And if the Congress begins to see this kind of uprising in their backyard, 
that's the way we can get a change. The problem is the Congress is so isolated and insulated from popular opinion, and all they read is the inside the Beltway journals, and they get the money from Wall Street. But if they see this movement, there's a chance we could get a Glass-Steagall bill through. But it's going to have to come from the streets, not from the idiots and the, the, the Congress. So we are standing at the door of revolution around the world, and particularly in this area of the world. That's what I'm hearing you say, basically. We're standing at the door. And that is, unless change comes, this is what's going to happen. Is that right? That's right. And this may be the only way we can have peaceful change. And so your listeners out there should go to our website, become familiar with the ideas of Glass-Steagall, which is a simple idea. It simply says, no more bailouts. We're not going to benefit the speculators who swindled this country out of trillions of dollars. The reason they have no money for people with food stamps, they have no money for teachers, and they have no money for unemployed people, is that it's all gone to Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan Chase. Trillions of dollars have gone to fatten the fat cats. And now they're saying, even with the housing, uh, the Obama administration is saying they're going to have to get out of the housing business because they say they don't have any more money. That's right. And so what you have is trillions of dollars created by the Federal Reserve going to the people who made all the bad speculative bets. You know, Kahari, it's like if you went to Las Vegas, lost your mortgage money, and then you went back up to the management and said, can I have my money back? They're not going to give you your money back. So why are we being suckers for this Wall Street scam? It, it makes what Madoff did small potatoes, because we're talking about 20 to $30 trillion. Oh, my how goodness. Much, how much of that would be necessary to solve the budget problems in the states? Just about think of what you could do to America if you spend it on the people, 20 to $30 trillion. My well, goodness. All you'd need is $150 billion and you'd cover all the state deficits. Then, if you spent new credit in programs like NUAPA and create 7.5 million jobs, as Mr. LaRouche has proposed, those people would start paying taxes. So they wouldn't need a handout. They could be working. We could take our young people who have no skills and put them in these projects like the old Civilian Conservation Corps and the WPA projects, building something productive, reopening our factories to produce the heavy why isn't these why aren't these proposals coming from president obama because he as mr larue said was put in there precisely because he's going to defend the bankers over the people Ooh, let me hear from you at 821 the lines are full let me go start taking them one by one magic 98.9 you're there go ahead yeah i have a question about uh the useless eaters and the eugenics yes speak a little bit about maybe Margaret Sanger. And Margaret Sanger, uh, Holly, uh, Margaret Sanger, who uh, actually, well, I think, uh, designed and created Planned Parenthood right. uh, out of the eugenics movement. Holly, can you break that down a little bit? Sure. Margaret Sanger was not some person who was really nice and concerned about women's reproductive rights. She was a eugenicist. She thought we had too many bad quality people. And when these so now, let me stop for a minute. Tell people what that term means. Well, when they say eugenics means basically purifying the human race. And the people who supported it were primarily very wealthy Caucasians who thought that black people and brown people and Jews and gypsies and Mediterranean people were inferior genetically. Now, what was their proof? Their proof was that they had been left out of wealth and that they couldn't take, they, they weren't bankers and they weren't smart people like the, the Ivy Leaguers who set up the eugenics movement. George W. Bush's grandfather, Prescott Bush, worked together with the Harriman family to form a group that was trying to purify the race in the United States before Hitler. These are people who actually were behind things like the Tuskegee Project, they were behind the, the testing, which said that black people are inherently inferior. Mm -hmm. And so when, when Mr. LaRouche talks about Prince Philip and his type saying they're useless eaters, this was the group that put Hitler in power in Germany. Ooh. And they have the same view in the United States. Because Prescott Bush was involved, from what I understand, the Bush family was somehow involved in funding the Hitler regime or providing sources of revenue. Is that true or not true? It's absolutely true. It's a historical record. 
His bank, the Union Bank Corporation of New York, was shut down by Franklin Roosevelt in 1942 because they'd been providing millions of dollars for Hitler during the time when Hitler came to power. And up to the point that we had even declared war against Nazi Germany, the Bush family was still funding the Nazis. Ooh, goodness gracious sake. Let me hear from you. 821 9890. 821 9890. 98.9. You're on there. Go ahead. You're on there. Turn down your radio. Please turn down your radio so I can, so I can hear you and you can hear me. You're on there with Harley Schlinger. Go ahead. Yes, I wanted to get on the air to ask a question. Yes, you're on there. Go ahead. Okay, yes. Um, when he was speaking about uh, the people taking back the government, mm -hmm. it kind of brought the thought about the popular vote and electoral vote. Mm -hmm. And with the popular vote, you know, that's the people's input uh, as far as, like, you know, getting a candidate, however. But the electoral vote, you know, that's based on the state seats. I mean, the people don't have anything to do with that. So if the electoral vote is the... Well, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Because uh, the electoral votes are awarded to whoever wins that state. Yeah. So your votes do count. If you vote heavily in a state and your candidate wins that state, your candidate gets those electoral votes. Yeah, but, I mean, how can you say that with the influence of the British Empire? He spoke about that. But who are the, uh, the American political people involved. Who, well, so. Okay, well, let me, let me have Harley re respond to you. Go ahead, Harley. Yeah, Kahari hit the essential point. There's no way they can manipulate the vote if enough people turn out to vote. The good thing about a mass strike is that people who previously were not political or not active are now becoming activated. The masses of the population would oppose Wall Street if they knew what the issues were. So our job is, as people are in motion, they realize they have to fight for something, we have to make sure they know what the issues are and who the enemy is. That's why Mr. LaRouche focuses on the British Empire, because the British Empire has been dumbing down the American people, so people start thinking, well, my vote doesn't count because of the Electoral College. We control the Electoral College by the way we turn out the vote. Now, the, the, okay, so let me let, let, let me in, let me interject on that. Go ahead. So, so, so if you're saying that, you know, you're also saying that these, uh, the the ones that are in control of the electoral vote, what you're saying, they can't not be influenced, and we know that has been a tragedy within, you know, the form of of, of government policy that po politicians are being influenced by corporations and other influences, oh, so of course, you, of can't, course you can't actually, wait a minute, let me get this out. Okay, well, come on. So you can't actually say that we can find some kind of reassurance in the elect, uh, electoral vote when there are politicians who are influenced to... Oh, I see what so. she's saying. What she's saying is that the big money people control the politicians. So even if you elect these politicians, you put them in office, they will not be responsible to the people. I think that's what she's saying. Am I correct? Absolutely. Because okay, okay, Holly, Holly, respond to that. How do you get around it? She makes a very good point. How do we get around that? Look, the only way we get around it is with a, a mass movement, because up to this point, we've seen people, look, there are good, some good people in the Congress who've made terrible votes, like in 1999 when they got rid of Glass-Steagall. Only a few people voted to protect Glass-Steagall. Now, if we have a mass movement saying, you give us Glass-Steagall or we're going to run your ass out of office, then we'll get Glass-Steagall back. So the point is that the ability of, of corporate interest to control the vote generally depends on things going along, at least where people are still somewhat comfortable. Most people are no longer comfortable. That gives us the opportunity to get people to recognize that they've been swindled by corrupt interests that have bought the politicians. Now, we've got to find politicians who aren't able to be bought. In the meantime, we have to take those who are in office and scare them into doing what's right. Oh, my goodness, America. Oh, my goodness, Columbus, the world. Are we on the verge of a revolution on this planet? In Ohio, in Wisconsin, in the United States, and if so, what does that mean? Joining us is Harley Slanger, West Coast representative for Mr. Lynn LaRouche. As you know, Mr. Lynn LaRouche was with us the first half an hour of this hour. Let's go to you. Magic 98.9. You're on there. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, your guest Harvey needs to clarify some things about 
Lyndon LaRouche. Go ahead. Uh, one, is he still in jail? Okay, and if he is, why was he in jail? Two, in terms of President Obama not caring about the people, like he said. Uh, let me make, oh, okay, let me give him a chance to respond. We've got about two minutes. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, go ahead, Holly. Well, first of all, Lyndon LaRouche was put in jail by George Bush Sr., and he was charged with conspiracy to defraud the Internal Revenue Service. It was a political frame-up. Uh, Mr. LaRouche was called, but there were many people in, in Africa and Europe and, and Russia who protested. He was called the Nelson Mandela of the United States. So if you look at the facts on this thing, he was a political prisoner. In terms of President Obama... You're saying, you're saying much like Huey P. Newton and some of the others. Absolutely, because he told the truth about the bankers. He told the truth about the swindlers. And that's why he spent five years in prison. He didn't make a deal. He didn't run away. He wasn't in club fed. He did hard time. And, and he's very proud of the fact that he didn't sell out. Now, the second question, where's President Obama on the, the how people losing their homes? Where is he on creating jobs? All he's done is transfer, he's continued the Bush policy of bailing out Wall Street while Americans are losing more homes today. There are 7 million families that are on the verge of losing their homes. Wow. First, President Obama, he's saying we have to protect the banking system first. That's what we're saying about President Obama. My goodness. Harley, we're about 30 seconds. Uh, give me your final comments and tell us where we can reach you. LaRouchePack.com is the best place to go, L-A-R-O-U-C-H-E-P-A-C.com. And my final comment is, join the demonstrators, find out what's right, and give the American people back their country. The only way that can happen is if the American people act. We have an opportunity to do it now. It's not just in this country. It's in Germany. It's in Africa. It's in uh, Ireland, people are moving, but we have to make sure they know what to do. Okay, now, Holly, if they want to reach you, is there a phone number that they can reach you by? Sure. Tomorrow morning you can call 800-922-2907. Say that again. 800-922-2907. It's toll-free. Just tell them you heard it on Kahari, and we'll get you some literature. All right, I appreciate you. Thank you, Harley Slanger, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. LaRousse. But most importantly, thank you for being a part of this.